shout out to Lola El Sayed and Sarisha CJ. Thanks so much for subscribing to my channel. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for regular uploads and your chance to include in shout outs for future videos. Hi everyone, welcome back to another video in the Soap Makers Lounge. Um, today we have Clyde Yoshida from Vibrant Soap. Hi Clyde, how are you going? Good morning. Well, good morning for me. <laughs> well, it's good morning for me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'll let the viewers know because I'm sure they'll find it funny, but I'm wide awake. I'm not asleep. It's actually 2 a.m. here in Sydney. <laughs> Nothing like having an interviewer who's wide awake, so that's great. Oh, good. Yeah. So I was worried that I was going to be like, uh, but no, I'm glad I woke up at one o'clock. So I woke up earlier so I can get the grogginess out of the way. Right. <laughs> oh, gosh. Right. So um, just a couple of questions. Like, uh, well, first, I'll just say that um, I started the Soap Bakers Lounge because um, I just wanted to introduce something positive to the soap making community. I was first focused um, in Australia, but um, the, getting the positive feedback from viewers both here and like abroad, um, people saying it really helps us even though we're not in Australia, so keep them coming. So um, I'm really happy um, that uh, Kenny from uh, Royal Appleberry mentioned you and I looked you up and we got in contact. Because uh, I just absolutely like as soon as I seen your your soaps and your website, I'm just like, oh wow, this is um, these are really really beautiful soaps, and I'm sure that viewers will have something to learn from you today. So thanks again for being a part of the Soap Makers Lounge. Oh, so nice of you. No, I'm, I'm looking. For, I was looking forward to this. So excellent, excellent. Uh, and so whereabouts are you located? I'm in San Diego. So uh, right at the one corner of the country. So anything that has to do with national gatherings, like conferences, generally okay. we have to travel. But right, yeah. Yeah, right at the corner. And um, I'm not very good with my geography. Is San Diego in California? Yes. Yes. It's okay. Right. Okay. Southwestern <laughs> corner. Yeah, that's where we are. I thought I'll just cover that because I wasn't really sure where it was. Right. <laughs> Closest to you probably in the States other than in Hawaii. Well, yeah, that's right, because it's on the coast, isn't it? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the coast, and then if you fly over the ocean, then it's Australia. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, um, I know um, from in the past when I've ordered like just packages from US, um, it comes from straight from California. When I, when I used to look at the map, it would go straight from California to Sydney, so it would be a one-way trip. Mm-hmm. So I assume they ship everything to California, international orders, and then it goes from California to Australia, I guess, because that's the more direct route. So I, that I do know. <laughs> I don't know much about the geography down in there either, to be, to be fair to you. Okay. But I've well, been to New Zealand, pretty close. Oh, oh, so you've been to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, I think, three hours away, like by, from Sydney on the plane. It's actually pretty close. Wow. Yeah. I, see, I haven't even been to New Zealand. <laughs> You've been to New Zealand, I, I, and I haven't. You know, surprisingly, I've never actually been outside of Australia. I've never oh. really flown outside. I've, I have a bit of a, flew, a fear of flying, um, and I can only handle, like, one-hour flights, like, to another state. But anything longer than that, I don't know if I could. Right, right. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it, Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, um, okay, back to back to soap making. Um, how long have you been making soap? I think it's been about nine years. It might be a little longer. Right. I I gauged that by when I started doing the YouTube channel. Okay. But I was soaping a, a little bit before I started that, so mm -hmm. probably around nine, ten years. Wow. And um, what what kind of started the the spark, what was the spark that made you kind of want to attempt your first batch of cold process soap? It's an interesting question because there was an incident that happened that made me think, yeah, maybe it's about time that I jump into soap making. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in anything that has to do with creating something. Right. So whether it be cooking or painting or music, I, I'm, I'm there. So I actually have to put blinders on so that I don't do everything under the sun. Yeah. 
the the impetus for starting was a friend left homemade soap on the, the doorknob as a gift. Okay. When I got home, there it was, and I smelled that, and I thought, I, I really want to m- know how to make this. Mm-hmm. So that was the, the very beginning of that. And uh, there's a couple soap-making companies nearby within, like, 15 minutes driving distance. And I thought maybe the way to start making soap was to go to that company and they sold a kit. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that was yeah. my first bar. And that's wow. how I, I got hooked. Just yeah. by that. Hooked on the first time, right? <laughs> <laughs> then mine was going, how am I going to continue to do this? Right. Right. Well, I call it the, uh, I don't know if you picked it up because you did mention you have um, watched a couple of uh, the Soap Makers Lounge videos. Uh, I call it the Soap Bug or the Soap Disease. Like once you start, <laughs> it just grows and grows and grows it and doesn't does. stop. <laughs> it really does. And so you start making all these bars and you go, I, what am I, I've got to start selling it or something. I can't mm-hmm. just keep making it and mm-hmm. have all those bars all over the place. Well, see, that's that's kind of kind of what happened when I first started. Um, I just because I just kept trying so much, you know, I just wanted to try everything, and I was trying to find out like my area, my lane of surf making. And before I knew what I ended up with, a whole bunch. I'm like, oh, geez, I've got to get rid of them somehow. I'm not going to be able to use them all. But I, I was lucky. I had a local cafe near me, like two minute walk from my house, just across the road, and um, it's very hipster, like new age type cafe and um he's just got records all over the wall and really nice paintings and like just really this is such a beautiful place and he's got heaps of pot plants around um you know those like uh what's that those uh bonsai plants right yeah and um in between the bonsai plant stuff, I'll put the soaps there. Like he was, he was nice enough to let me just like kind of put them there to begin with, and they started doing really well. And then people were commenting that they like it, and that's kind of how I got started. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way. Yeah, like it's just yeah, it's like just, I, I'm, I still can't believe like five years ago if someone said you're going to be a soap maker, I would have just like oh. Pfft, like, Whatever. Right. <laughs> That's common with a lot of us too. But it's, you know, I've exchanged a lot of stories about how people got started. Hmm. Hmm. And it's, it's really interesting because the word organic doesn't pertain just to our products, but hmm. how we grow our companies. That's right. Right. You just, yeah. you like, you found that venue and you went with it. And, uh, well, also, well, actually, what what really like the the spark that really got me to making was I I had really bad eczema, mm-hmm. and I was especially up here on my shoulders and my arms and my back. Um, that's right. where it affected me the worst, and here as well. Um, I probably can't see on camera, but I have a, a few scars from like when I was itching, and it was just so like. And I tried lots of organic soaps, like commercial natural soaps. And nothing really helped my skin uh, until I started to make my own soap. Mm -hmm. And my first recipe was 70% almond, 30% olive oil. It was a really soft soap. Like, it just melted away. But I noticed after using it, and I didn't want to waste it, my the eczema patches started to go normal skin color. They were, like, red and blotchy. And I'm thinking, because that usually does happen with soaps, like when you try different soaps. So I thought, oh, it's nothing new. Like, I'll give it a bit more time. And then after, like, three to four weeks, it started to clear up. Mm-hmm. And I was eczema-free. I've been eczema-free for, well, since I was 27. So I'm, well, 28. So I'm 33 now. And if my memory, if my maths is good, <laughs> I'm five, six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> six years ago, yes. Yeah. So I've been eczema free for six years. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great. That was that's actually been part of the conversation when um selling soap is that you know, while I don't I don't know about your soap, I don't know if I want to buy it because mm-hmm. I have this eczema and that, that opens up the conversation. Yeah. You know, homemade, the cottage in- industry yeah. soap as opposed to commercial soap. Mm-hmm. And that's when you learn that the education out there about what's good for the skin 
is not very strong. It is not. Yeah, it really isn't. I just I found with my dermatologist, I kept going to dermatologists, GPs, you know, my general practitioner, and it was just all like to fix the pain and the itchiness and stuff, and it was all temporary fixes. No one was able to give me an answer, and they all said avoid soap. Soap is the worst thing for your skin, your eczema, don't use it. And I listened to them, and I tried. I moved away from soap, like commercial soap, and I tried so many different alternatives. Nothing really helped until I made my own, and I realized, well, there's something in it. Like there's obviously something in handmade soap that is different from commercial or, you know, just the everyday product you get, like at the supermarket. Right. Or another way of saying it is what's not not in our soap. Well, that's exactly, that's right. Yeah. And, of course, naturally, my next question for you would be, like, when, when you made, when you got that kit, that soap maker's kit, and you, you know, you were able to use your own soap, did you immediately notice the difference? Well, you know, I I did. Yeah. But I, so I guess I'm lucky because I never really had any issues like that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have any issues with your skin, things like that, and you use uh, superior soap, yeah, you can't help but even feel better. Yeah. You yeah. Know, just from wherever you are, I think if you've been using that detergent on your skin at, um, you know, commercial soaps all this time, that the switch to things with more natural oils and no additives beyond what's pretty natural. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think I did begin to feel um, better. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I just find like when I use like, when I use a soap, like after the shower, my skin feels hydrated and smooth and soft. Like it's, it just provides, I, don't, I think people that aren't familiar with, you know, handmade, um, so like how we make, then they're unfamiliar with how all the benefits associated with actually using it because they're going by what they, you know, the commercial soaps that are detergent based and they're really not that skin friendly because it's when you, when you use it and I used to use it, I mean, I'm guilty of using it. Um, it just like it, my skin will be really dry and like tight after the shower. Like, and people don't realize that when you re when you use real soap it's meant to clean you and of course because we super fat our soaps as well it it doesn't dry or st strip the skin it's just really nourishing to the skin yep and i know and that was my my education in getting into the soap making business was learning what a super fat mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. because i believe that that first kit that i found yeah um and it makes sense that um, people that put those kits together mm -hmm. would probably go for a formula that's really bubbly. Right. And right. Because that's what people expect. And that's I do. Right. Who doesn't like, you know, good bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not necessarily the most hydrating to the skin. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the hunt goes on. It's been um, almost like a just a regular thing for me to kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to play with the recipe so that I can get the best of both, mm -hmm. I'll get the better ladder, ladder bubbles and the super fatting to a point where it's really comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I learned that it's really regional too there. Um, and where you come from, because when I was in my master's program and people came in from all over the country, Notice that the people that were from, let's say, Egypt mm -hmm. come and say, you know, I, I just really feel okay. But the people that came in from more humid climates and mm -hmm. tropical climates just really felt that their skin was itchy and dry because mm -hmm. they had gone to from a um, kind of moisture in the atmosphere location to a more arid location. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, oh, wow, I would never think of that. Where San Diego is kind of weak at a little of both, but uh, generally dry, probably right. like down there, right? Um, it's it's dry in winter. Uh, well, actually, no, it's actually, it's always humid here. Like okay. in summer, even when it's like cold or like cooler, if you look at the humidity level, it's generally above, it's definitely above 50%, but most days it can be like 80, 90%. 
like I think right now is ninety percent humidity, even though it's twenty degrees Celsius, mm. which in Fahrenheit I'm not really sure what that is. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, I think it's seventy five Fahrenheit. I think. And, and do you notice that seasonally you'll feel your skin um, more hydrated, for example, in the humid months than the dry months? Um, I find, well, it's just my skin type. I find um, in summer I've got oily skin. Mm-hmm. In summer and early autumn, we're in early autumn, well, we're in mid autumn now, but early autumn is generally really humid still, really sticky. And I find, yeah, my skin is just oily, really oily. And um, the best soap to use, I don't know what it is, and I just is the one hundred percent coconut oil soap with twenty percent super fat. Right. I find that the best for my skin in summer. Yep. Yeah, it's just it just yeah, like it gets rid of all the excess oil, but at the same time, it doesn't dry my skin out. Well, that makes sense too, and I, I don't think it's spoken of in the industry as much, but. It could be that you could sell basically seasonal soap to, if you're depending oh, yeah. on yeah. humid that time of the year is and yeah. so forth. Absolutely. Right. But I find like <clears throat> even in winter, like this is handmade soap is very funny, like in a way, in a good way, that it kind of goes against sometimes the, like as we were discussing the norms of like the industry and what people say, like what's good and what's not good for your skin. If even if I use it in winter and my skin's not oily, it still doesn't dry my skin out. So mm-hmm. I can actually use it all year round, right? Um, but generally in winter, I don't know. It's just it's like I don't know if it's a psychological thing or. But I tend to go for the more plain bars in winter. Yeah. Like the more my go-to bar, like in all other seasons, is a seventy percent olive, thirty percent coconut oil. So that's right. my like go-to bar in winter and spring. And then some, I just gravitate towards the coconut oil bars. But I can use them. You can use either one all year round. Like in this climate anyway, I don't know about like where you are. But um, in this climate, yeah, it doesn't It doesn't really matter. Like you can yeah. use it whenever and it doesn't, it seems to be okay. It seems to be all right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. This subject has rarely come up and I've talked to a lot of soap people. But, yeah. you know, there, there's this first plus if you're going to be using a, uh, a pure product as far as what we make, right? Yeah. You're stepping away from the detergents and added to yeah. soap. But then there's a matter of degree of even better benefits when you think of how much super fatting you add to a more pure soap or so mm-hmm. forth. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. We have a great control over our product. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very true. Very true. And yeah, like, you just have to be a soap user to really, or at least start using soap to understand, like to really grasp. Because when you explain super fat to someone that is not a soap maker, it's a bit hard to kind of get the message across. Right. Um, but to a soap maker, like, of course, like we, we understand straight away. But yeah, like I find that's, and that was, that would be my next question. Um, was, is that some, is that, was that a challenge you faced when you started to sell your soap? Um, it, it, the amount of um, super fat in particular, or yeah, like just like kind of getting the knowledge across, like the barriers, you know, like um, when you weren't speaking to soap makers or people that were aware of the process of soap making, was that like something you had to kind of educate people on? Uh, I I think I did because um, first of all, the the first bit of the education I think was well, I have. I don't want to use it because I have sensitive skin. Okay. So yeah. it really opens up the conversation to yes. perfectly for selling your own soap because, mm-hmm. you know, the next question would be, well, what kind of soap do you use? Mm-hmm. And generally it's what's available in the supermarkets, right? Which is mm-hmm. not um, handmade. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was a, a, some degree of that, um, but, you know, it's, you, you learn after you answer this question quite a bit on how to answer that question about super fatting is that mm-hmm. imagine soap that has a little bit extra oil in it so that it can nourish your skin. Yes, right. And they said, oh, yeah, that, let, me, let me try that. Right. And I had quite a range 
soaked in. I, I, I'd have soaps that are were less super fatted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, and, you know, just by practicality after a while, I, I kind of gauged it. Like you were saying, your favorite soap recipe percentages, I started to think, I, I can just make my general formula, formula to be not drying and not overly super fatted, but mm-hmm. right smack dab in the middle. Mm-hmm. And again, because I sell a lot in California, um, that middle of the road it works for us. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And um, like, of course, like yeah, you started the the soap making kit, and you started to make soap yourself. What was the what was also the drive? Like, what made you kind of start wanting to sell and put your put yourself out there? Because, of course. Um, I don't know if you've seen Catherine from Coconut Lux. She's someone I also interviewed, and she and I always use this and always like give a shout out to her. Hey, Catherine, <laughs> um, because she says your brand, your brand, your personality is your brand, right? So, what was the to start selling? What was the push? To start selling, it was just a practicality of continuing to do something I really love to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't new to me. It was new as far as soap was make um, soap soap was concerned. Mm-hmm. But I'm also a painter, oh. so an artist from almost all my life. Right. So in that respect, my my painting my paintings and my soap were an art form. Mm-hmm. And I was really fascinated by the fact that as a paint, this is one of my pieces right behind me, by the way. Yes. It's, right. a, it's on the surface of the canvas. What I, was, what I was intrigued with was the art of soap goes right through the bar. So that has later become a spiel from me to those people that said, oh, this is too pretty to use. <laughs> You've heard that before, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah. But I said, you know, we'll use the soap because the design goes right through the bar and you'll so actually see the, the swirls change. That's right. And I, so. I'm really fascinated by that feature of it. <laughs> um, but, but getting back to what you're saying about um, that soul searching and as far as becoming a soap maker, I, I have advice to a lot of people going into soap making for the first time. And that is do a lot of exploration at the very start because you have, there's a lot to learn. Mm, there's a lot to learn about mm. the chemical reaction of making yes. soap. And if you're like me, the soul searching was, I am going to make cold process soap that I can do the colors and the swirls. And I don't want to neglect the fact that you can make more natural soap without all those things. And yes. you can use yeah. uh, more natural colorants and everything. So the, the, the discovery that I had to go through was, okay, it was already a, a search for a brand. How am I going to brand my company? Mm-hmm. How am I going to name my company to suit that, you know, what I want the soap to be? And so I came across, well, you probably know, you, a lot of the great names were already taken. (laughs) You have to search for a name that that's awesome, but it's not already taken. And I I was going through anything that had to do with what I thought the soap I wanted uh, was all about. And that's when I came across the word vibrant. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, even though I I do really love the natural soaps, mm-hmm. and I do make them from time to time, I was in a business networking group that was all about okay, if you start a company, how are you going to brand it so that you're not all over the roadmap? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, like you said, you got to be true to yourself, and the big part of myself is this artist. So vibrant soap is going to define what I do. So I'm not doing everything under the sun Mm -hmm. so that I can become recognizable in a company that somebody thinks of brightly colored soap. I want them to think vibrant soap. Vibrant soap. Yes. Right. Right. Um, So the soul searching that I went through was a lot of uh, watching a lot of YouTube videos on soaping and how to do these techniques, how to get this look to it, Mm -hmm. how much, mica is too much mica but still get these bright colors and um i met so many um established soap makers who took me under their wing and said you know 
anything from I like what you do to I want you to start speaking at my conferences. And mm -hmm. um, we talked earlier about um, how comfortable you feel in front of people. Oh, presenting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I love that stuff. So, right. <laughs> uh, but that's when branding became a part of defining what I was actually going to do with my own soaps, mm -hmm. as well as develop a name that made people think of a certain kind of product. Right. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And of course, like the feedback you were receiving from customers, was that because obviously like you had your, you, you know, where you were going, you were focused on what Vibrant Soap was, what you, what, you know, what you were aiming for. Did, did you realize that the customers with a like-minded thought process kind of were attracted to you? I did, but I also was, um, I did more um, festival soap okay, right. sales and, and tables and things. And um, as much as I, I applaud everyone that does that, because it's a lot of work yeah, it is. Set up all the yeah. time. Yeah. But I think that's almost necessary to um, really get immediate feedback. Because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, people, uh, things I learned, I can't even tell you all the things I learned. I could, but one of the things was what soap bars were they picking up the most? Yes. And what that was telling me um, which ones they would smell and really like the scent of. Mm -hmm. Was it more fragrance or more essential oil? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I learned was there's this variety out there of what people liked. And I started saying, well, I'm going to, within my brand, I'm going to have some variety there so that people that like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. And, yeah. and so forth. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's what that's kind of like what I'm going through at the moment. And I've been on the fence for a while, but um, I'm not going to like change my like the way I kind of make soaps and stuff because I really like I'm aromatherapy based. I love aromatherapy blending and creating different um, scents and really making them stick. And so, like I, I have a full tutorial on how to effectively scent your soap with essential oils and using clays as well. Um, but I kind of, I'm on the fence. Like I want to introduce just a few bars with fragrance oils um, because I feel like, and everyone's been like, even on YouTube, but I did, I did one video, right, out of all those videos I have where I used the fragrance oil and everyone was commenting, oh, like, because like you were saying, like your niche, your, your area, your track, like people that have a similar mindset to you and they're like, Oh, you know, don't, don't use fragrance oils, like stay, stay with essential <laughs> oil. Like that's why we, we love watching you, you and your channel. Like it's okay. This is just a private label. soap. like, like that same cafe I mentioned earlier, I do private labels for him. And he said, please like just use fragrance oils. Like I'm fine with whatever. Like, so there are some bars I make for him that are essential oils and some that are fragrance oils, but the cafe there, they're not like, like with my followers and people that buy from me, like direct and stuff, they're used to what I make, but I can put different stuff at the cafe here and people love it and they'll grab it and they're like, they'll appreciate it. So I kind of want to, but I don't want to like, because my customers, like, I don't want to think I'm moving away from how I started, if that makes sense. Yeah, but so I, I think I'm just going to leave it. Like, I'm not going to – like, I would like to. Like, I've tried micas and fragrance oils, but I just don't want to – I don't know. Like, don't fix what ain't broke is what they said, what they say. So, well, It sounds like you and I went through the same kind of thing at the very beginning of our businesses to de define what our soap was going to be within yeah. a certain margin. Yeah, because even your name, the Donna Organics, would say to me, That's essential right. oil would be the route. Yeah. Well, I yeah. I thought about you know the under the umbrella of vibrant soap, mm -hmm. I could do both. I could both. do right. um, and which I do. I do essential oil soaps and I do the fragrance yeah. oil soaps. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I kind of, which is not a bad thing because I'm like it's fine, but yeah, like with the name, I have restricted myself because. If I did want to introduce, yeah, like a fragrance or a mica and people see Dawn Organics, like, uh, 
it doesn't really go together, like, you know. Um, so that's why, like, I, I've been okay with private labeling because that's a way, like, just small quantities, not, like, major quantities because I do want to focus on, like, my business. Um, but it was a way, like, an avenue of me to satisfy my creativity and my curiosity with micas and fragrance oils while leaving my brand natural. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be using them. I wouldn't be playing around with all these different, you know, ingredients. I've only just started using titanium dioxide and micas like three months ago. Mm -hmm. Before that, like for the whole four years of you know Dawn Organics, I've never touched any of those stuff, and I've always was curious. Mm -hmm. um, but now I guess I'm able to play around, and and my sister was like, "Oh, why don't you create a, another soap brand?" I'm like. And use fragrance oils and micas. I'm like, no, man, I'm not going to have two different, like, I'm not going to have two different businesses. It's like, enough to do one, I know. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. <laughs> I, I think this is an important discussion because um, a lot of people that are enjoying making soap for the first time and say, you know, I want to turn this into a business. Yeah. That, that upfront thinking is can either make or break your business oh, down the road. Absolutely. Yes. And I think what you, you and I are saying in different ways of defining what our soap companies would become <laughs> is it has to be maintainable. Yes. And the best way to be maintainable is you're kind of true to something that you feel strongly about at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Because like me, I, I had to be creative to sustain myself in this business this long. Yeah, actually, since you touched that, yeah, I, I remember when I first, because I, I did have the mindset already because of, like, kind of when I started to make my own soap and I was only sticking with nat natural ingredients, um, that kind of left, like, made me go on that path. So I don't, I absolutely do not regret it. Um, but when I first started using essential oils, I found that, uh, it was a little plain and I wasn't like very compared to fragrance oils. Like you pick up a fragrance oil soap and go and like, Oh wow. Like that's great. You know, but then you pick up the essential oil soaps like, like mm, it's not that, you know? So what it kind of forced me, what for, and it was great because like, I just love it. Yeah. Essential oils are better when you create blends with top middle and base notes and you have to fix it for it to really be a product for you to pick up and smell and go, oh, wow, that's really nice. So it's it's an art. It really is. It's an art. And you have to really know what you're doing. And, of course, safety precautions, like with dermal limits, there's a lot more safety precautions with essential oils um, because certain, <clears throat> certain essential oils can affect people with heart problems and you have to know ratios and be wary and careful so like once, but once I got my head around all that, I really absorbed. That's when I knew that I was in my avenue, I was in my lane. So as much as like, and this is important for people, as you mentioned, you got to know where you're heading. You got to know who your customers are for your business to flourish. Exactly. Yeah. You know. I mean, that, the thing too about the essential oils, I took a little mini class, is that. There's a lot of knowledge that you want to arm yourself with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you don't want to create something unintentionally harmful. That's right. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. the, those not all essential oils, number one, will give a pleasant scent. That's right. Not all essential oils are compatible with skin health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I've had, I've had some people say, well, why don't you make a, um, something with cinnamon, essential oil well I, you gotta say it's not really a good one for the skin mm -hmm. um so it's it's not it's not total play what we do <laughs> right right it's, it's right yeah exactly uh, we exactly. both picked that up but, um, um oh, i've gotten some shockers like people emailing me or messaging me with um essential oil recipes for soap and i just look at like oh my god that is horrible like and some of them are from books 
like you'd think that you could trust like a book or you know an author or soap makers that release books and stuff and like with cinnamon it's absolutely beautiful to use in soap but you have to limit there's a limit and it's i think per, i think a pound is about half a kilo of oil so two pounds is one kilo so every one kilo of um so of, of carrier oil in your soap recipe maximum three grams yep. like it's just a really small amount like it's very because if you go over it can irritate the skin but right. if you go too much over someone with a heart problem same with peppermint if you go too high will increase their heart rate and gets in their bloodstream because essential oils absorb through the skin quite rapidly right. and it goes into the bloodstream and it can affect people with heart problems i mean i remember a, a place i supply my soap to i won't name any names <laughs> but she was saying that <clears throat> she was for a while she was using essential oils undiluted and uh, on the skin yeah and she was using peppermint right and she goes after a few weeks i had to stop because my heart rate was going out of control i'm like yeah peppermint's a stimulant just like cinnamon it's a really big stimulant to the heart and this is a young healthy person in their 30s like imagine someone that's got a heart problem right like you've got to be really careful about what you're doing and i always even though some people say oh you know some essential oils are safe for babies and stuff I just don't recommend any essential oils for anyone under three. Mm -hmm. And if you did up from three to five, the only thing I would ever recommend is lavender. That's it. And not full strength, half strength, like right. very, very minimal. Um, it's just, yeah, like, and I've seen people like, oh, you know, like peppermint soaps. I've seen people make peppermint soap with uh, quite a substantial amount of peppermint in it. And like, oh, that's a lot. Like, you shouldn't be using that much. Man. And they're using it on babies. Oh my like, God. oh, my God. Oh, my God, don't use it on your baby. Like, it's the worst thing for your baby. And they're like, oh, really? Oh, I didn't know. Or, you know those essential rollers, essential oil rollers? They'll make their own version, and it'll be like 20% peppermint oil. And they're letting their two-year-olds rub it. On their, and I'm like, oh my god, what are you doing? Like, you've got to research, like, you can't do that stuff. Like, it's you've got to take extreme care with essential oils. Like, it's not, it's not a joke. Like, you can harm someone, you can, um, someone's skin can really break out into a rash. Oh, it's just, you don't want that stuff. Like, right. Well, you were talking about a little earlier on about educating, or yeah. we were talking about educating people on. You know, there's that fallacy out there that if you throw the word natural out there, that yes. it's good for you. That's right. But there's just lots of natural, dangerous things out there That's in nature. Right. Exactly. you got to know how to negotiate around those things. You're right. Yeah. And like in moderation, everything's got a limit. Like it doesn't matter whether it's natural or not. Like it's like, you know, using fragrance oils, like it's the same. Like if it's got a dermal limit of 3%, you don't go adding 5%. Do so because when someone uses it, they're going to most likely break out in like a rush or very irritating. So even with fragrance oils, people, some people, not everyone, but there's always some people that aren't really familiar with how it works and they'll use whatever usage rate they feel like they want to use and not really check the safety limit for what they're using. Right. Yeah. So and, and that was true for not, I mean, Every ingredient we put that's in our That's right, soap. exactly. Yeah, whether that's natural or not. Everything has a limit. It's really important to look look at what the limit is because it varies between every oil. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, going back, if you wanted to, like, kind of <laughs> uh, compare the soap you make now with – your first few batches of soap, what would be like the biggest differences? Well, that kind of ties into how I themed my soap or branded it. Also, I wanted it to be, I want my, my batter to be fluid enough that I can do the kinds of swirls that I want to do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do appreciate a nice hard bar. Yeah. 
Right. So th- those things kind of fight with each other sometimes. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, so I've continued to grow as a soap maker, and it's always been interesting to kind of not just settle on the um, recipe from myself. Um, and it's been a creative endeavor too, because I, I make, I have made my own silicone molds oh, uh, into shapes. Like I've made these tiki statues, and then I, I bought the kits to make uh, silicone molds out of that as a, mm-hmm. the original piece. Yeah. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to add something to this recipe to make it more a harder bar of soap. Mm-hmm. So I start. Uh, I start to use kokum butter, which okay. is uh, right. very hard. But then the price to pay for that is it also um, accelerates. Yeah, yeah, and you have yeah. to work with it really quickly. It's so hot. they're not okay. that, right. those are not as fancifully swirled. Right. So I allowed the 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 fancy mold to take the place of my. Um, lack of swirling in that okay right right okay. so so i've kind of changed um as far as my recipe and soap making um in that regard but i also know that there's some s- swirling ideas that you can put in your soap that you don't need that fluidity so i can bounce back to a soap better that um solidifies more a little quickly okay Right. Because I don't need to have that intricate swirl. Right, right. Well, you know, and this is a recent discovery for me too. <laughs> Citric acid really slows down trace. So I don't know if you do you use citric acid in your soap? No, but I, I do know. Um, I do know. I, I have it in a, a, a shampoo recipe. Okay, right. Right. Yeah, but I do know yeah. it slows it down because, yeah. I mean, just the alkaline and the acid yeah. light there yeah. would yeah. make yeah, sense. Um, if you add it to the, the lye, the water before adding the lye and the reaction happens in the lye pot, it slows down trace. But if you add it after emulsion, the some people do a 50-50 citric acid water solution. And then if, when you add it at, um, after emulsion, it speeds trace up. But when you leave the reaction in the lye pot and you let it form sodium citrate in the pot, in the lye water, when you actually add it to your soap, it, I've just, it's just like, wow. Like some recipes that move very quick, like my ocean, and this used to give me such a big headache, used to be the worst recipe to make, but I, used to, I still, make, still made it because everyone loved it was the 20% coconut oil, so, sorry, 100% coconut oil, 20% super fat. But for the water, I use ocean water. So that really speeds it up, right? But since adding the citric acid, it's still traces fast, but I have an extra 45 to 60 seconds to work with and split the batch off and color. And then I, I'm able to do it in the pot stores now. Whereas before I wasn't able to do in the pot stalls with that recipe, it was such a nightmare. Um, but yeah, like yeah, just wouldn't I give it a try? Maybe it'll help solve your dilemma. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. and then you know some add some sugar to it for the bubbles and yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's yeah. there's still a lot to learn. I've learned a lot, but I can keep going. Well, salt too. Like I, um, I use a two combo salt and sodium lactate. Mm-hmm. So I do one point two percent of each um, for the oil weight. So that's how I was calculate my additives, and um, always go by weight as well. And I find doing just a little bit of both really adds amazing longevity, and um, the sugar as well. Like, just really nice lather, really skin conditioning. And it's really important, like I always say to people, these additives are so inexpensive. Just play around with them, like, and see, like, you know, which one you like or if you want to go with or without because not everyone wants to use those additives. But um, it's just a really inexpensive way, you know, to kind of boost your bars in, you know, more, having a more luxurious type feel. And... Citric acid, I find, like, 
some viewers have mentioned, and I've realised as well, um, it creates a silkiness to the bar. Like when you actually when you actually use it, it it's like a, it glides a lot better, and it's like really silky. Have you found that with using citric acid? I, well, again, my my use of that has only been in the shampoo bars, but I do notice it's really s slick. It feels yes. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and that's too because I think um, that's taking the place of the kaolin clay. Yeah, clays. Yeah. On the clay to be a heavy. Yeah. Thing on hair. Yes. Citric acid is really beneficial in that particular recipe. I find. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Um, right. So um, we touched our base on uh, before about um, some of the challenges uh, you faced when kind of selling your soaps, mm -hmm. and more so um, them not knowing the benefits of handmade soap and kind of comparing your stuff to commercial stuff. Aside from that, like what other challenges did you face when um, starting to sell your soaps? Mm, you know, how to reach an audience, I think. Um, mm. I know I had a quality product, but I also know what what is a quality product when you have this range of types of soap. And I was, like I w we talked about earlier, trying to brand my soap as not only being good for you, but also looking beautiful. Right, right. But, you know, so I thought, well, the YouTube channel would help in reaching an audience. And I think as I look at my um, analytics, that most of my online customers have seen me on YouTube. Okay, right. So, so you know, challenge is if you're going to start a business, how are you going to get find your target mm -hmm. uh, customers? Um, and then I don't know if you know Karen from the UK. She's been making videos for a long time. She has a um, company called Eden's Secret. And I was I learned a lot from her before I even started. Right. And one of the things she said was, if you're going to start a soap business, make sure you know you're not going to make it immediately. Right. That's she right. Says, you yeah. know, give it at least give it at the very least three years, mm -hmm. so that people can find you. I mean, That's it's right. so vast. So I think that has been one of my challenges. But I wasn't hurting financially so i could mm -hmm. look at i looked at this as a just a a fun thing that i could put my mind to that there's things to keep me occupied and my brain happy mm -hmm. and it had everything that i needed because i was still speaking i was still teaching okay well, i early retired from teaching still teaching talking to people i was still writing i was learning how to take photographs, mm -hmm. I was learning how to edit. Um, so all these things were enough to really keep me nourished as far as my mind was concerned. And that's not even talking about the actual making of the soap that mm -hmm. I learned a lot from. Uh, and then certainly meeting people and being invited to the conferences and uh, open houses and soap companies, things like that. I got to meet the people. So um, what seemed like a very cold thing talking to my camera in the kitchen all by myself um i got to see that it's delayed reaction i do get the yeah. people time later on mm -hmm. and i do get to have the comments that follow later it's just this really weird delayed reaction mm -hmm. um <laughs> i the, the and the, the challenge that i had was that i'm not per se a soap person in that I'm a painter, I'm a musician, I'm a writer, and soap making is so time consuming. Time consuming in that you know that there's maybe a half hour prep, mm -hmm. there's at least a half hour cleanup. That's right. The soap making is like 20 minutes, it yes. just happens here. That's, That's right. what people really see. Yeah. But I was saying, okay, I, I have devoted myself to soap making because I love it mm -hmm. for close to 10 years. How am I going to make room for all the creative endeavors that I kind of gave up? Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of finding that um, um, 
telling the soap audience right now that I'm moving to a different country uh, very shortly. Oh. I'm limited in how much I can ship. Right, right. So what I plan on doing yeah. is keeping some equipment to start up again if I want to do that. <laughs> but I also want to give uh, take uh, the opportunity at this time to get back to painting. I really want to get back to painting. Right. Um, right. Even though I have friends that are in Portugal right now that says, don't give up soaping because the market there is wide open. And the uh, the Portuguese are very, they prize the homemade. Okay. So I'm in an actual a Facebook social group that's devoted to people that are making products. Wow, well, interesting. So soaping is still not out of the question. Right, excellent. I think you, you, you just, I think you're too addicted by this point. <laughs> I am. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. That you, you probably too in starting out. The pure <laughs> al alchemy of soap making is so fascinating that you can take such different products and put them together and it becomes soap is still. Yeah, exactly. Boring. It's That's amazing. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. So I'm making just, uh, well, I always refer to it as a life school um, because it is like, I mean, if you go back and you read about like World War One and World War Two, and because um, I used to work in aged care and um, there, there were some World War Two veterans that were, um, in the home and um they would say like one of the and back then i wasn't a soap maker i was like a teenager in my early 20s i didn't really think about making soap but they would say oh gosh you know one of the most rarest things to to come by sorry bug <laughs> <laughs> the rarest the rarest things to come by it was soap i'm like really and they're like yeah it was you couldn't get it it was just non-existent um we had to learn how to make it and they learned how to make it um, from their local butcher. They'll get like tallow from their local butcher. They'll render it, and um, they would go to their local park or ever gather the ashes, and they would burn burn it up and run the water through it and make tallow soap. And they'll say that it used to be so harsh on the skin because it was light heavy, but. That's what they had, and they couldn't. <laughs> like, that's what they used. They, they, it was saying that you, we used to hurry up and have a shower, like two minutes, like quick, because it was caustic, and um, there was no control measures. That's how desperate they were for soap. It was great for cleaning, but of course you had to clean yourself. So they would say you, they would limit their showers in two minutes or less, like to because it would burn. So quickly wash, quickly rinse off, and the shower was done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are challenges. I don't know if I answered your question about challenges, but uh -huh. to me, that challenge right now is how do I um, morph back into my painting? Right, right. And also trying to resurrect my my music career too. So, okay, that's the challenge. That's interesting. Excellent. Well, well, you can give us. I can edit this part out, but. <laughs> You can give us a demonstration if you like. <laughs> oh, my oh my gosh, that that's that's a that personal bit was that when I was taking care of my my parents, mm -hmm. um, as they went downhill, maybe because an emotional thing in me, it it really took my voice away. Okay, wow. and so I'm finding that it's starting to come back. So wow. I'm not getting interested in. The okay. performing part again. Okay, excellent. So, but yeah. I, uh, to just tell people, I'm not going to completely disappear. Yeah. My channel is going to become um, making something and also possibly becoming a travel vlog. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I'm sure people will appreciate it as well. But um, I think like you might take a break, like you know, just the way. It goes, but I think you'll eventually go to soap making again. <laughs> yeah, because it's just, yeah, like, I don't think a soap making, after making soap for so long, can go for extended periods without making again. <laughs> you know what the hope of that is? Is that we're so busy packing up the house, donating stuff. Yeah, There's right, a lot to right. do before that. What am I doing in my spare time? I'm making soap. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's definitely a part of me that wants to continue to do it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, like yeah. 
Gosh, and even if it's just for personal use, well, right. I'm sure you're not going to go back to commercial soaps. You're going to make your own. <laughs> so even if you like, even if you, I'm sure you'll make just as pretty soaps for yourself, I'm sure people would start would still love to watch that regardless. Right. So. Well, the funny thing is, there's limited amount of stuff we can bring this first round for a year. Mm-hmm. What do you think? a substantial part of the weight in my bag is just going to be homemade soap. So that will have some <laughs> crazy. But well, you can always do a crazy sale, you know? Yeah. Get, well, we're thinking minimize. not just for sales purposes, but we want to continue to use handmade soap. Of course. Yeah. Um, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So apparently it's not as prevalent in Portugal right now. Because even when we did a trial look in Portugal, mm-hmm. it wasn't like in every store that we see here. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, like, there would be um, definitely a market there for you, for sure. Yeah, I think I think I can find my way in again. Um, that I think learning the language would be helpful. Yes. Yes. So I'm doing that right now. But I think a lot of them speak English, don't they? Like in Portugal? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just it's this thing here that I feel like if I'm gonna live in I see. Yeah. I want I wanna live up to right. the challenge and I know I can I know I can learn it. Just right. kinda, Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So um what what general um advice would you have for people that are starting a business in soap making or that are thinking to start a business in soap making? Yeah, well, I um, just recently saw. Uh, I don't. You have NPR down there, NPR Radio down there. That uh, is, we call it PBS sometimes, but well, I guess not. It's called National Public Radio. Okay. But it's, right. um, it's funded by pu- the public donating, so that they're not tied to government. They're not tied to um, corporation money. They're, right. So the the quality of the programming is amazing, and so this interview that I heard was about um, something that sounds unrelated, but it is related to what your question is. And that was, um, this man was talking about those performing artists on the radio that had one hit, that they call them one hit wonders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why some were one hit wonders and why some just became household words and ended up having, you know, 50 albums during their career. So far, still going strong. He said the advice he would have for performers these days is when you're younger try everything like make natural soap make slab mold soap yeah yeah it all because it's going to come back and make you a stronger Mm -hmm. soap maker later on if you you've tried a lot of these things Mm -hmm. and once you find out through the process of making a lot of soap you're going to start discover what you're strongest at or what people like the most. And I think that's kind of what I did. I, I just was trying so much. We have this other program on YouTube called Soaping 101 that I learned a lot from. Kathy, Kathy's become a, such a good friend of mine too. And oh, really? She was, yes. Oh. We, she was the one that invited me to the first conference and, wow. and I'm making soap and, you know, presenting every year since she had said that banning the pandemic. Right. right. But, um, so she would have these things that like she would teach you how to use these ingredients or teach a new soap swirl. And I was waiting every week for these so that I could do these mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. for my basic fun. Yeah. I didn't have yeah. any rhyme or reason that I was developing my, com- my company, but I really was because I was learning the ropes it wasn't, I don't believe that there's this like quick fix. You just jump in, you're going to be this massive success. That's right. That's because right. I also believe that you have to find yourself and your passion that mm-hmm. will carry you through the long haul. That's right. And that's what I was doing too. So um, so if you're going to, to make it in the soap business, I think learn as much as you can. Try as many different things you can. Start to look at what you do best mm-hmm. and promote that. And not lose that passion for the excitement you had in getting started in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, Because all of that will even help with the branding of your soap company. That's right. As time goes on. What what are you going to name your company? 
mm-hmm. what's your logo going to be? All these little things that don't seem important will bring recognition to your your company. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. That's my big advice, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. Excellent advice. And um, what advice would you give, like, people that haven't made soap, but they're thinking about making their first batch of soap? Because we've all been there. <laughs> so, yeah. What would your advice be? I, I, like, I like how I started. Again, I didn't plan it. It just happened that way, is that if you feel like you want to make it, make a first batch. Mm-hmm. See if you really do enjoy it. Because I know there's some that said, oh, I thought I was going to enjoy this, but I did it and I didn't really much care for it. Well, you never know until you try. Right. Um, there are things like recipes to worry about. You want safety. You have to know the safety of making soap, yeah. working with lye. So the safer route that I took was to find a kit that included the goggles. It mm-hmm. included gloves. Yeah. It included a mix of oils that was already ready. Uh, it contained a little bottle of the lye crystals mm. for making that. <laughs> so after I was hooked by making that first kit batch, I thought, oh, my gosh, I, I wish I could find a recipe that um, that all the inv- ingredients were readily available. And because the first recipe that was in the kit was with shea butter, which okay. is something that back then I you couldn't go to the grocery store yeah. and buy shea butter. Yeah, right. And um, now I look back, I could have used tallow. I could have used need that as sort of the hard oil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, more and more, I think soap making classes are becoming available here and there. Mm-hmm. That if you're really curious, that would be a good start because They'll have the ingredients. Yeah. They'll know how they'll know how to keep you safe, hopefully. That's right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably a good safe way in. Well and watch watch a watch a thousand different yeah. YouTube <laughs> channels. I know, I know, absolutely. Oh, and I just and for beginners I always like that's why I'm like, Well, you know what? But yeah, I always um recommend Soapy one oh one. Like that's just fantastic tutorials for beginners, especially people that have never made soap at all. She's got a way of really um, showing the process and makes you confident because she, she Sabi 101 and Ellie from Ellie's Everyday were the two that I watched um, before I started making soap. Right. And I was really scared of lie, and but they gave me the confidence. Right to kind of start and it's like once i started yeah like wow like you know loved it um, but yeah i highly recommend ellie's from ellie's every day and effie Eth- from soapy 101 absolutely they're just fantastic and soapy 101 and i've said this a couple of times before is highly underrated right highly underrated and still a lot of people that don't know about soapy 101 as big as the channel is but there's been a lot of beginner soap makers. I'm like, do you know Soapy 101? I'm like, no. And I'm like, oh, wow. Like, you really have to go watch her stuff. She's really, really good. And really only good. that she is such a nice person, Kathy, Kathy like, McGinnis. You can tell. You can just tell. Yeah. Like, you can tell. Yeah. 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 That, well, I was also watching a lot of Anne Marie from um, Brambleberry. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. another one, too. Fabulous. Through the magic of soap conferences, uh, conferences, I got to meet her as well. And she's just so so oh, genuine God. and knowledgeable oh. that oh. I actually, I don't know if you followed my channel at all, but I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of yeah. made this swirl and Amy from the soap challenges. Okay. She, yeah. 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 She, yeah. Said, she said, Oh, I really like what you did, came up with there. What should we call it? And I said, I don't know what to call that swirl. She says, let's call it the Clyde slide. <laughs> which was funny because I would never ever think of naming something after me right so years and years later and I noticed on Soap Queen with Anne Marie that she did the Cly- Clyde Slide and I go oh my oh, gosh I, uh, no. she wrote a book and I yeah. read the book it's a great book on business and all this and she was at uh-huh. a conference she was the keynote speaker and she says who do I make this out to I said 
Clyde. And by the way, thank you for doing the Clyde slide. She looked at me and she goes, you're that Clyde. And I said, yeah, I'm that Clyde. I go, oh my gosh, my like celebrity knows my name. And she goes, she said to me, um, we need creative people like you. And so thank you for making that. And I thought, who, she's great. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's another one I watched too, Anne Marie. I discovered yes. her a little bit later because, mm -hmm. um, of course, like in Australia, um, well, for me anyway, like because I was fairly new to start making, Brambleberry for me wasn't really known. I um, stumbled upon Brambleberry when I was already watching Sapping One Hundred One and um, Ellie from Ellie's Every Day. Uh, because it's from the comments. So people mention, oh, you know, this recipe, Brambleberry, whatever. I'm like, oh, what's Brambleberry? And then, then I got onto Brambleberry, but I really, I was already making soap when I started watching Brambleberry. But also Brambleberry and Marie, fantastic tutorials for beginner soap makers. Um, yeah, just as useful as all the, all the others, just really great. I just, unfortunately really made so but i still watch her tutorials yeah. really really good yeah she's she's fabulous yeah i actually would love to have her on my channel i reached out to her but uh, i know she's probably busy but <laughs> running that big company but she she's also so genuine when you get to talk with her and the thing i really like about her channel is that anyone that's saying what do i do if i'm a new soap maker go watch her mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because she will constantly go over the safety measures mm -hmm. and precautions for taking it from That's me. Right. Exactly. Yeah, she's great. She's really good. A staple in the soap making community. Yeah. yeah, like just yeah, she's really, really great. And um now that you like you mentioned because you've mentioned YouTube of course, because you have your own YouTube channel as well. And I'll ask about time management, like obviously with Vibrant Soap and you know managing your YouTube channel. Is work-life balance an issue sometimes for you? Like, how do you manage both? It is a big juggle because I, the way to make it happen for me is to give up a lot of other things. Right, right, right. Because it's, um, it's not just the soap making, it's the, it's the making of the video. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like with a limited amount of space that I have, it's, there's a light stand. There's the camera. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it looks like I have a lot of room and I really don't. There's a little wobble every once in a while. Well, that's because my arm is hitting the light stand. Like so, um, but it, yet you want to give them the prime view of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then once that is all done, I'm not done because it takes me hours to edit those. Yeah. So um, cool. don't get me wrong. It's a labor of love. I love to do that. Um, and I'm glad I did because all these skills and learning how to make a video and editing them has prepared me for doing any kind of video as I recreate myself for this next move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get what you put into it. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And what are some of the challenges like you faced also or some of the realizations also like when starting the YouTube channel? Like, what, what were the challenges you faced? Like, you know. Well, I, one of the things I did, I was, I got to like pat myself on the back because it was a younger me back then and I didn't know what I was doing. But I said, before you start this YouTube channel, make sure you commit to it mm -hmm. because it would be very easy to say, oh, I don't really like the way it came out. Um, you don't have to do it anymore. I, as a teacher, I know that there's a learning curve involved, just mm -hmm. like with soap making. Yeah. If you have a blundered batch the first time and just give it up, you may be sacrificing this great success in what you do later on. Mm -hmm. So I decided, number one, I'm going to stick to it. Number two, what I wanted to do was give some face time at the very beginning so they know there's a person here. Yeah. Right. Um, because many of the the videos that I saw before is I saw the hands come in and I always wondered 
who's doing that? Whose hands are <laughs> making those? Skulls? That was just my personal thing. Yeah, not, yeah. Not but I just thought, I want to know who is making this. So, for example, and, and there's we were talking about Kathy and we were talking about Anne-Marie. Mm -hmm. Anne-Marie would always talk to the camera first. That's and I, right. got, exactly. I got to know her in a way that I didn't know Kathy until I met her. Whereas Kathy did some of the other things that I like that I put on my channel, which is if there's something important to say, not to just say it, but to put the text on the screen. Right. She does that right. really, really well. Right. Um, yeah. Be clear what you're doing. Don't put your camera on the table so that when you're pounding it down, the camera's not jumping around yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I was paying yeah. attention to these kinds of things. Yeah because I wanted it to be seamless and I wanted it to be a calming experience. And yeah, the payback right. for that time that I thought about that was people saying, oh, it's so calming. Yeah, like, that's right. Know, so, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah. So let's give some thought about, I mean, if you're going to do your YouTube channel, it's um, be, know your craft well enough to teach it. Be honest about what you still don't know, because you mm -hmm. can still learn that. And then they can learn along with you and um, speak to your audience. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, interesting. Like, actually, that was my first few videos off of YouTube going back, I think, 2019. And this is when I wasn't really that really big serious on like YouTube or anything. But the reason why I did my first few videos, um, because like how I kind of uh, envisioned Dawn Organics was to be in retail stores. So I've, um, I deal with a lot of wholesaling and retailing, so like to health food stores. And a couple of them were on consignment. So I would go in and stock up and they'll kind of uh, pay for what they've sold and I'll go mark off what's sold and restock. And more often than not, when I was um, – and even when I approach new stores, like if they would like to stock my stuff, and because I'm six foot five, I'm a very tall, big, broad-shouldered man, and you know, beard, and you know, I walk in and, and I say, you know, like when I get asked, you know, oh, do you make the soaps? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like I get that. I'm like a giant and everything, but. Um, that was the reason why I got videos out there because people were questioning whether I made it or not. Right. And I just found it really odd. I don't know if it's like the way I look or something. I don't know. Like people don't think I make the soap. So yeah. now that I've got the videos up, I'm like, ah, now people can't say that I don't make it anymore. <laughs> but for me, that was what started right. me doing videos. But then Obviously, I continued for totally different reasons. Um, but, yeah, like, it's just, yeah, well, I just thought I'd get that out there because, yeah, well, that's, people probably don't know that about why I started my YouTube channel. <laughs> but I guess now they do. Now, yeah, I just love it. I just love teaching people soap. I just love right. sharing the knowledge and making sure, like, I know I spent a lot of money at the beginning, Um when I first started making soap, especially with essential oils, as you know, essential oils are very expensive and um, you make, you know, lots of different batches of soap and the smell wasn't sticking. It'll, um, it'll flush out or evaporate out after cure time. And um, I've, I wasted a lot of money and a lot of time at the beginning. So I wanted to pass on all the trial and errors I went through to other people that are either starting or, have tried essential oils and so, but you can really make long lasting um, blends even well after a year. Like I can pick up a soap after one year and I could smell it and it's still beautiful. Like, so yeah. that's, I just wanted to give back the knowledge because I know it's yeah. not easy. <laughs> yeah. It's not, and you know, it's the other thing that occurs to me is I hear you talk about that with the ingredients and all is that at some point in time, when you kind of click over into making more soap mm -hmm. to sell, you got to make that choice on whether you're going to buy your ingredients in bulk. Yes. That's because right. you save yes. so much money. Oh, you yeah. know that you're going to be using a lot of 
particular oils. Yeah. Don't buy it in those little kind of containers. Uh, like, that. Yeah. like, you know, yeah. essential, essential oils in health food stores where the vial is that oh. big, you would, you would go broke. That's right. right. I know. I know. Yeah. I know. And, um, Actually, uh, I don't know if you have that brand there. Let me just think of the name. I can't believe I forgot the name because, oh, yeah. Um, oh, I don't know if I can say the name because it's another brand. But I'll, I'll blank out the name. But, okay. but you know. I don't know that, actually. Oh, you don't know? Oh, okay, right. So I don't know if it's – I'm pretty sure they're global, but they are, like, in health food stores, like, they're really big, and you can buy direct from them. They sell like I think ten mil bottles of essential oils, and oh my gosh, the prices are f- absolutely ast- astronomically through the roof. And I guess like if you're using them, you know, like sparingly, like in a oil diffuser, that's fine, like no problem. But for a soap maker, oh, there's just no way. Like, and people would say, oh. You know, do you use these brands of essential oils and stuff? Oh, but these brands are better. I'm like, actually, no, they're not. They're um, suppliers that sell um, those essential oils. More often than not, they get it from the same cold press or distiller. So it's not like it's um, any different from the retail uh, retail uh, versions of them. Right. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And like, that's a- that's something you I don't know that you can teach that you got to kind of pay attention to your own business and, and how you're growing yeah, to say yeah. when do I jump from these little things to yeah, something bigger right. exactly because, yeah. uh, if you're going to just like you say have a diffuser it'd be s- silly to get eight ounces of essential oil right yeah right so, that's right yeah you'll get like a smaller amount it's fine you know but like that's yeah another thing for my for youtube as well like since we're talking about bulk buying is i actually in my description i go through the recipe and percentages i use and i actually tell people where i buy them from so which supplier i get them from i put them in brackets um, because i have a really great relationship with the suppliers and I, I love to support local suppliers too, like Australian businesses. So I tell people where I get my stuff from, hoping that they get some business from my recommendations as well. And that's not having any affiliate affiliations with them. Right. I don't get commission, nothing. It's purely because I want people to experience the beauty in um, what you can put in your soap and what I'm using so they can recreate exactly what I'm doing as well. Um, but, yeah, like, yeah, bulk buying and not just essential oils, even, you know, coconut oils and olive oils, yeah, astronomic, astronomically you save. I've, um, I'm sure the same for you as well. Like, you could cut your cost price in half. Right. Yeah, like, if you buy in bulk. To, yeah. to know the math, to be able yeah. to find out the, the price per ounce. Even. That's right. Yeah. And see how much you're losing if you get the small amounts because it you can guarantee right the smaller amounts are going to be much more expensive than of the course. absolutely yeah. yeah oh going back on that brand that I mentioned earlier I won't say it again because yeah, <laughs> I don't want to bleep it out again um, but yeah um, a small ten mil bottle I think of uh, like sweet orange was like thirty five dollars. Right. Yeah. But I, I can get a kilo, one kilo. So I think one kilo is equivalent to about 32 ounces, pretty sure. Right. So I get 32 ounces. I think it's 32. Yeah, 32 ounces um, for about $35. Wow. Right? Yeah. So see, like, same price, but I get one kilo. Right. Like, you know, and cedar wood. I remember. I think their cedar wood for ten mil was forty five dollars for ten mil. So ten mil is about seven grams. So it's you get even less. But I get a kilo for cedar wood. I think for seventy five dollars. So it's just like wow, like you know, that's really important. And more often than not, it's this, they get it from the same place. It's from the same farmer or the same distiller or cold presser. 
It's right. the same quality. It's exactly the same thing. So that's why I like to educate people, especially in soap making, because it's not like you're going to be using a few drops. Right. You're going to be using a considerable amount of soap, so you really want to save yourself some money. Right. If you had a soaping buddy where you didn't want you get you can get scared away by the cost of a bulk item too because you're buying more of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can be very afraid that you're not gonna use it all and waste it but yeah. if you have a buddy that you can split that with that's right exactly yeah that's a good idea that's actually a very good idea yeah yeah i never thought about that yeah so other people yeah <laughs> buy in bulk but split it with another soap buddy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really good yeah that's that's excellent that's really good advice <laughs> no, I'm a soap buddy, right? Yeah, that's that's great. If only I had a soap buddy when I started. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> right. Gosh, all right. So, um, we're well, talking about bulk items and ingredients. What's your like favorite oil to work with in soap making? So many, you know, the, the staples there. But I think uh, if you're talking about kind of more unusual, a little slightly unusual, I've really mm -hmm. come to like avocado oil okay and i like a lot um i've started using hemp oil okay and uh rice bran oil yes right i've only been recently experimenting with the rice bran oil well just yeah. the, the things that are in it that are good to have in yeah it. is yeah. it what vitamin b yeah yeah it's so or vitamin is it b or e but anyway it's it's, it's a got good both thing. it's actually got both yeah. B groups because rice, rice has got B group vitamins and vitamin E. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm my own guinea pig. So, like when I make that and try it out, I go, oh, That's a good soap. It is, it is a really good soap. And it's got high amounts of stearic acid. It actually makes a really hard bar. Mm -hmm. It makes a really long lasting bar. Um, I, I was experimenting a lot with 70% um, rice bran, 30% coconut. And yeah, it's a long, it's a very long lasting. Bar, and a conditioning bar as well. It's not right. drying at all. It's really nice. Trace is a little fast, but, <laughs> but we're not afraid of that. But we're not afraid of that. <laughs> yeah, so it's fine. No problem. Makes great soap. Yeah. That's <laughs> and um, what about like other additives, like any particular colors, like micas or? Yeah. Well, again, I've met so many people that have their own companies too, and um. In the U.S., there's uh, there's several, and I'm not going to name them because um, I like them both, and I mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of them pretty much. But I do know them, and um, you get to just know your suppliers. You know ones that have colors that are pretty true. That once the soap saponic buys, it's not going to change into some That's, wild color. Yeah, yeah. You know, the greens and oranges are notorious for change. more. <laughs> uh, but not the ones that I've used recently that I've focused on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, again, the key is in those cases to buy a small amount to test it out first. Um, different advice from the essential oils, right? That yeah. you don't want to be stuck with like a lot of something that you've never used before that ends up being useless to you. Yeah, right. right. Um, and I, like, I like oatmeal soaps. So mm -hmm. I like that a lot. I like how it feels. Um, my probably my best soap mm -hmm. is avocado, where I use the whole avocado puree, and it ends up being oh. such a it ends up being such a creamy, wow. smooth soap. And it's not just my thinking on it because I have, I have friends and they say, yeah, yeah. What do you think is your favorite soap? And I think back on it. I've made it a lot because I've yeah. sold it a lot. Yeah. And I said, try it. And they said, oh, you're right. It's just such a creamy thing. And I'm, 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 I, I really can't say enough about um, this concept of using the whole mm -hmm, mm -hmm. product, like right. the whole avocado as opposed right. to just the oil. Right, because, right, right. You know, what comes with that is a lot of other good stuff, like even the microfibers that are in these wow. things. Wow. Well, I don't think I ever, yeah, wow. Well, I never thought about using um I've seen in the past, like, uh, people using, I think, have a, yeah, like the flare, like they get the little bit out and they blend it in with their oils. But I never actually tried it or used it to know um, what it feels like. But I can imagine, like, yeah, 
Pick it and up. Speaking of soaping 101, that's where I started to learn about how much can you add of this material? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because with food stuff in these products, you have to make sure it's all saponified. That's right. You don't want it to go bad in your that's soap. That's right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's that's something that you can't just say, I'm going to dump all this in there. Um, <laughs> there's a certain rule of the chemistry yeah. that yes, yeah. you can put that's this right. much in there. <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to end up with a side with things growing out of it. Oh, no. Because no, no. <laughs> that, that question comes up. I said it, it will not... It will not spoil, not if it's saponified. Yeah, not if it's the right amount. Like it's yeah, like it's with anything. It's like when you go too high of a super fat, it's gonna eventually like a lot faster than you know a normal super fat type. So it'll go rancid, it'll develop you know dos, and it can really have a very unpleasant odor when that happens. So yeah, it's the same. Like even just when you looking at the base oils in your recipe too much super fat in the chemistry like if you're not knowing what limit to stick with you can end up with um that's a thing i actually see quite a lot is uh oh my soap after you know a few months it smells you know and i'll ask them you know questions why and they're like oh 15 percent super fat or some something like outrageous i'm like oh my gosh well that's probably why and a lot of the times, like when you buy oils from the supermarkets and stores, they only have a few months shelf life of them already. So when you're using that high of a super fat and a um, near expiring oil, that could even leave you with a very unpleasant soap at the end of it. <laughs> it could be gross too. I mean, I, you prop, like you, you'll go into a shop and you'll see soap. And of course, you have to go to it and hold it and smell it and all that yeah, stuff. Well, yeah. went to the store... And yeah. I picked up the soap, and my my fingers left an impression in it. It was so it was it was like goo. Oh wow! It was like too much, probably super fatting. So yeah, that is way too much. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, right. yeah, because it's yeah, like meant to be solid when you pick it up. But <laughs> yeah, this was not, this was not a feel good soap. No. Oh wow! Well. Wow. Well, I would like to thank you very much, Clyde. I have really enjoyed this chat. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of the Soap Bakers Lounge. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, it's like a conversation with you. It didn't feel like an interview. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Just an easygoing, nice chat. And, well, now that, um, you know, we've, you know, uh, we're in touch, and I'm sure I will be, we'll, we'll keep in touch as well, and I'd love to hear about, your adventures in the, uh, Portugal when you make the move and uh, hopefully you won't give up soap making, you'll continue soap making. <laughs> well, I do hope we'll keep in touch because, you know, this first time really meeting you, this was really pleasant to talk with you. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks, Kenny. <laughs> no, thank you, Kenny. Because I know she Kenny. Is. She's like, oh, you have to interview um, Clyde and chat to him. And I'm like, okay, sure. So <laughs> thanks, Kenny. <laughs> I'll be better right now. Hi, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. All righty. Uh, just thinking about her makes me laugh. She's so funny. Me too. <laughs> All righty. She thanks, Clyde. Too. What's that? She makes beautiful soap, too. Oh, yes, yeah, she does. Oh, I'll be sending her a package soon. And um, she's sending me some of her soap soon. So I'm like, ooh. I'm really, really excited to receive some of her soaps. Um, I, uh, the oak wood one in particular, I looked at her oak wood soap. I'm like, oh, I really want one of those. So she's going to include one of those. So I'm very happy about um, receiving that package in the next few weeks. So <laughs> thanks, Kenny. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Clyde. And um, we'll be in touch soon. Great. I'm sure. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.